bad for his church. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 24, verse 42, Watch therefore, for you do not know the hour your Lord is coming. I want you to know, church, that Jesus Christ could come this month. Or he might come next week. Or he could even come...
Not only is all your affliction momentary, not only is all your affliction light in comparison to eternity and the glory there, but all of it is totally meaningful. Every millisecond of your pain from the fallen nature or fallen man, every millisecond of your misery in the path of obedience is producing a peculiar glory you will get because of that. I don't care if it was cancer or criticism. I don't care if it was slander or sickness. It wasn't meaningless. It's doing something. It's not meaningless. Of course you can't see what it's doing. Don't look to what is seen. When your mom dies, when your kid dies, when you've got cancer at 40, when a car careens into the sidewalk and takes her out, don't, don't say, it's meaningless. It's not. It's working for you an eternal weight of glory. Therefore, therefore, do not lose heart, but take these truths and day by day, Focus on them. Preach them to yourself every morning. Get alone with God and preach His Word into your mind until your heart sings with confidence that you are new and cared for. Oh, you me, yet I will praise you. Oh, you say. Oh, 
song to the one who's all I need. I'll sing a song to the one who's all I When I was little, I used to sit by the window and watch the world go by. And my, oh my, did the world go by because time flew, yes, time flies. And it carries us all to the day we're six feet deep with services by graveside. And all we ever really want is for it to be a great ride. So I used to sit in the back seat on the driver's side, passing time, and I'd watch every single car that passed us by, or at least I'd try. And at 10 years old, all I could think was, I wonder where they're gonna go on the day they die. Still to this day, I look out my window. And sometimes I roll it down and I let the wind blow. And I close my eyes and I listen to the sound of travelers traveling by with the sun on my face as it illuminates the sky. And I can still hear the sweet voice of my mom from those long Sunday drives. And she'd say, son, you can be anything that you want to be. And if it were up to me, I'd make you believe that God's plans for you aren't make-believe, they're reality. And mom, I've been out here living those dreams and I hope you're proud of me because you taught me what it's like to live life powerfully. You showed me what it's like to silence the voices of those who say life is only a pursuit of a salary. What a travesty. To live for money, it's a tragedy. So mom, to be rich with no faith, forget it. Because of you, broke is what I'd rather be. Because if money talks, I don't want it to talk to me. Because I'd rather be a poor man stuck in poverty than to be a slave to paper, refusing to trust in God's sovereignty. At 10 years old, I was inspired. I was inspired. I was inspired to live a life that inspires others to take off the flat tires and travel freely down the highway. Like I don't care what Satan tells me. Not one single thing is gonna stand in my way because I'd rather be out here being made fun of for Jesus than to be forgotten in my driveway. And let's be real, man, so many of us do. And we waste opportunities to get out there and spread truth. And we wake up at 85 and say, what happened to my youth? I never put it to use. Christians are afraid of letting their voice be heard. Even more afraid of letting God's voice be heard through them. Now realizing that their life is on display and it's a show for all to see like true men. And the dead men around them, by the power of their testimony, could become new men. We make excuses as to why we don't live sold out like, yo, man, I'm just human. Yes, you are, but God isn't. And when he hung on that cross and said it is finished, he gave you a blank page of penance and here, write the first and last sentence. It's a war. Are you going to sit on the sidelines or get up and get in this? Because it's a fight, man. Every day it's a battle for what's right. It's a fight for your life. And so often the wrong feels so right. But I read the last page of the Bible. Believe me, it's going to be all right. But until he comes like a thief in the night, I'm going to live this life like every day is a gift from God because every day is a gift from God and God didn't give us this gift so that we would wallow and be set adrift into a sea of selflessness. Like what can I achieve and how much can I get? So we buy into this American dream, but really, it's just an American scheme. A suicidal society where we scorn the Tim Tebow's but celebrate the Charlie Sheen's and we wonder why we're losing the teams. And we wonder what it all means. It means that sin is on the rise, we bought into its lies. Thank God Jesus is still in the business of saving lives and he can save yours just like he saved mine. And because he did, I don't have to focus on who I was or what I did because Jesus forgave, yes Jesus forgives. Not that we would drive through this life looking in the rear view at the old you because Jesus doesn't say I told you, he only says I love you. Three nails and two wooden beams Believe me, man, he loves you, and his promises are true, and the Bible is truth, and liberal professors who bash it are fools, but God still loves fools, and I'm really no better than them. I'm just a messed up dude who struggles with sin. But I'm not about to deny my creator to get an A on a paper, because one day my name will be written on a different piece of paper, whether it's soon or whether it's later, and someone in a suit and tie will stand on a stage as my loved ones cry, and will say the year I was born and the year that I died. And when they call my name, I'll be far above the fray in a place far away, all because I chose Jesus over this. Because I didn't want to sell away my Savior like Judas with a wink and a kiss. You can't pump the brakes on life's highway. You can't go back and you can't go sideways. And if I had it my way, I'd go back to the 10-year-old me and I'd say, Clayton, don't waste one opportunity to pray. Be different from this world and stand out in every way because we're all just traveling to our grave. And when you stand before Jesus, what will you say? When I became a man, I put away childish things. But before I became a man, I didn't always fit the shoes of a king. 
I was so lost and alone, listening to a world that said, do it on your own. Jesus was an afterthought. This world was my home, bumping Marshall Mathers and my car like, yeah, I'm grown. Forget putting God first. I was the Lord of my own throne. And searching for satisfaction is all that I'd known. Because before I became a man, I was just another middle-class clone. But when I became a man, I woke up. I stopped wasting my life, hoping and wishing that a better life would just show up. I started listening to my mom, and for so long said, son, you need to grow up. So I grew up, and then the thought of an average life made me want to throw up. So I threw up. Yeah, I threw up my hands and said, God, I'm tired of being a boy. I'm ready to be a man. Because one day, when my son takes my hand, I want him to know that it's not about what his dad said. It's about where his dad stands. I want him to know that I believe in a God who inspires us to have big dreams and bigger plans. I want them to know that, son, if God is for you, the naysayers of this world do not stand a chance because there's a difference between being a boy and being a man. When I became a man, I was ridiculed and laughed at. Whispers behind my back like, is he really like that? He must be uneducated. I was put down and degraded. Friendships lost. Relationships faded only because I chose to live the life for which I've been created. It's funny how when you mention Jesus, you're suddenly hated. It's funny because that's the same people who came back around years later when they saw me in the paper doing things with my life and giving glory to my Savior. And then I get a text, an email, a call. My life is in ruins. Can we talk at all? Yeah, we can talk. Because I'm still here. But I'm just going to tell you about Jesus, even if it's not what you want to hear. But I'm guessing that you already knew that I would, because you used to make fun of me for it. Misunderstood. So tell me about your life, and I'll tell you about your need for Christ. And we can keep our conversation secret. Your text about wanting to know more about Jesus, don't worry. No one will see it. But I hope one day you see fit to step out of the pit that you're trapped in and run to Jesus to take his hand and find a life filled with purpose and passion. As for the jokes that you cracked when I took a stand, don't worry about it. Life isn't easy when you leave the boys to become a man. When I became a man, did away with the notion of living for the weekend because I looked at society and all I saw was weak men getting up on Monday, dying for Friday, traveling in leased cars on the highways and byways like material things is all that defines me. Headed to cubicle jobs, trying to climb the ladder, clinging to money like it's all that matters. Boys who never became men, stuck forever in the past tense, trapped in spiritual adolescence. I became a man, I looked at my peers and said, I do not want to be like them. Clinging to the latest trend, dying to fit in, judging each other by the cars at their end. He's the man, he drives the Benz. I became a man. I said, I want something more for my life. More than getting wasted under neon lights on Friday nights, only to wake up on Saturday morning with plans to do it again. There are too many boys in this world and not enough men. I became a man. I said that when I leave this world, I want my life to have had purpose. So I stopped wasting my life on things that are worthless. Every minute on the couch in front of the TV was a wasted moment and a journey that should be defining me. A journey of forming a legacy. And I didn't want that legacy to be neglected. So I looked at this world and I didn't accept it. I'm not going to be who you want me to be. No, I absolutely reject it. I became a man. I picked up my cross and put down my shame. My sins were forgiven in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, my sin will forever remain an afterthought of who I used to be, but no longer am because God saw fit to crucify the Lamb so that I could land in His ocean of grace and find my rest in His holy place because He took my place. He took my nails. He took my hell. He took my cross. He took it all because He had a plan, and for the first time I saw it when I became a man.